Hi everybody and thank you again for joining me on another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode we're going to take a look at the Aperture Electrostorm CS15. So what is this thing? Well it's a 1500 watt output COB light. It has a CCT range from 2000 Kelvin all the way up to 10,000 Kelvin. It also has RGB capability built in CRMX and it is weather resistant. We're also going to take a look at some of the accessories that are available for it. I've got the barn doors here, I've got the supplied reflector, I've also got the Spotlight Max and its lenses. But of course, this review would not be complete unless we took a look at the motorized F14 Fresnel. Now, before we get underway, this is a pretty long episode with a lot of content in it. So just a reminder that it is chaptered and indexed, so you can skip the sections that don't interest you. And also just to note, there will be a follow-up episode where we take a look at the flood and spot reflectors, which unfortunately didn't make it here in time for this episode. Okay, so let's start off with how much it costs and what you get for your money. So it sells for about 7,000 US dollars. That's about 12,000 Australian dollars. Now for that money, you get a lot of wood, a lot of cardboard and even more styrofoam. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the packaging it comes in. So why am I mentioning this? Well, I think it's important to know. So if you're an owner operator like me and you have a small workshop like this, chances are you don't happen to have a spare forklift lying around. So when this gets delivered, it is incredibly hard to get off the truck. So it might be worth considering going to your local supplier, even if you have to drive a couple of hours to get there and picking it up off them. Get them to deal with all of the packaging, get them to deal with unloading it and just take the light home. All right, let's have a look at what else you get. All right, so the next thing you get is a fold out trolley, which is very well built, very rugged, easy to use. Check this out. Want to fold it up? Just give it a twist. How good's that? So what this trolley is for is the controller and power supply. So why do you need a trolley for it? Because it's huge and gigantic. Okay, so on the trolley here, you've got a quick release mechanism and you've got a receiver on the back of the power supply. So I'm gonna put this on the trolley, but I'm gonna do it on the ground because it's very awkward to do it up here. Okay, so the first thing everybody wants to know, why is this power supply and controller so unbelievably big? Well, one of the advantages it has is amazing low end dimming. So I know what you're thinking, for this size controller, the low end dimming had better be good. Let's take a look. The light is receiving its commands via CRMX. It is running off an 8-bit profile and the maximum brightness will be set to 2%. Let's start off with some one second cues. Now for some two and a half second cues. And now for some five second cues. Now, while that low end dimming capability is amazing and I can't think of any other light, at least in this sort of firepower that can do that, it does have something you need to be aware of. In order for it to do it that smoothly, it needs extra smoothing dialed in. And that results in about a one second delay between the command and the light dimming. Now that's regardless of if you're doing it manually or over DMX. Now the next reason that this unit is so big and heavy is it actually has two complete dimming systems. So it's got your pulse width modulation system for your smooth dimming and your accurate color dimming, but it also has a potentiometer dimming system for your high speed shooting. Now this high speed shooting mode does have some limitations. You can't dim the light below 20% and for some reason you can't use DMX. Now the next reason this is so big is it actually has dual power supplies. So the power supplies never run at full power. There's a massive amount of headroom on the power supplies. This means they're not gonna burn out and you're gonna get a lot of longevity out of your investment. Now the next thing with this unit is it has the most amazing power factor scores that I've ever come across. At 100%, it has a power factor unity of 0.99 and its power factor unity scores are very impressive all the way down. 
So that means this is very friendly when it comes to running it off a generator or an inverter battery system. But also if you've got hundreds of these in a studio and you have to dim everything down, you don't have to worry about issues such as meltdowns or transformers blowing up. Another reason this is so big and heavy is it can run 15 meters of head lead. So that's about double what everybody else can do. Another reason it's so big is serviceability. Apparently a lot of the things in here are modular. So for example, you don't have to replace entire circuit boards should something break down. And the idea is it is serviceable out on location, worst case scenario. Another reason it's so physically big is things like your inlets and outlets are not connected directly to the circuit boards. So should somebody use a lot of force to disconnect something, they won't break a circuit board underneath. The circuit board is separate to the connector. Now, in terms of serviceability, another big pro if you live in Australia is the Electrostorm series is imported by Technical Art Solutions and Technical Art Solutions have their own in-house service department. Now, that's a lot of pros and I think those pros are probably of interest to the top end of production. But for me, the big negative with this, 19 kilograms. That's a lot of weight. In terms of inlets and outlets, the controller has two DC inlets. You've got your AC power in, and on the opposite side, you've got two local area network connections, your DMX in and out, and a USB port. On the top of the unit, you've got your output to the light and a handle with two built-in rigging points. You also have four threaded rigging points on the back of the unit. And like all aperture lights, it has a very intuitive and easy to use graphic interface. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about is the stirrup or yoke. And I think this is one of the best built stirrups or yokes that I've come across. And one of the things I really like about it is the mounting mechanism. So what's good about it is you don't need to lock or unlock anything when you're putting the light on. It's all automatic. So let's just grab the light and pop it on and that is automatically locked into place. Now, if I wanna take it off the stirrup, you have to undo the locks on the side here and it spring loads into the unlock position. So you have gotta do both sides. Now, when I take the light off, everything resets. Okay, so now if I wanna put the light back on, there we go, nice and simple. Now the stirrup is made from solid metal, not hollow tubing and it has built-in strain relief for the head lead cable. The pin mount is solid metal. The mounting points to the lights are also metal, and it uses a disc braking system with metal handles. Okay, next thing we'll talk about is the head lead. So you get 15 meters of head lead. So not 15 foot, 15 meters. So that should be more than an ample amount. All right, so the head lead is made of a nice flexible cable. And my favorite thing about it, built-in strain relief. That is a great idea. Now, initially I was concerned when I first saw this because it's got a locking collar and the most commonly destroyed thing in rentals for me was HMI head leads with locking collars. This looks like it's gonna be pretty hard to destroy. People would twist the wrong section, but the, um, the connector here is welded to the cable. So that actually doesn't twist. There's nothing to twist there. The only point that can actually twist is the locking collar itself, so that's a great idea. But hey, check this out. I really love the fact that um, you can just use the strain relief system here. So that really is very well thought out. Now the connection points have plenty of visual aids and instructions to help people figure it out. Now the next thing for me really is a surprise inclusion. I didn't expect this at all, and I think it's fantastic, and that is a set of eight leaf barn doors. Now I think, Every manufacturer of high output COB lights should be doing this because COB lights with this sort of firepower are powerful enough that we can use them as point light sources. It's fantastic shadows off these things, but of course you want to control it. So this is a very welcome surprise for me. I really like this and eight, eight leaf barn doors, how cool is that? But here's the thing I really like about it. Let's remove the barn doors from the holder and put on the supplied reflector. Now the supplied reflector is a 35 degree beam. I really am a bit surprised by that. I was expecting a 45 degree beam, but anyway, that's what they've supplied. Now, here's the thing I really like. So many times I'm doing jobs and I'm using a reflector and I've got that bit of spill light I don't want. For example, I might be going through a diffusion frame. 
Wouldn't it be nice if they had a set of barn doors that just went on the front just to help you with that spill control? That is a really, really welcome addition for me. Well, the last thing to talk about in the kit is the light. And the build quality on this is absolutely sensational. This thing is solid. With the exception of the caps here over the locker, the glass front, and the little rubber seal here that covers the plug, everything else is solid metal. It really is well built. Now there are loads of rigging points on this. You've got four threads on either side. On the top, you've got four mounting points here that you can rig to, as well as the handle. And even on the bottom, you've got additional rigging points that you can thread into. Plus the feet are also rigging points. So it is very, very well thought out in terms of being able to rig this. Now the color scores are very impressive. This is because of the violet phosphor that's mixed in, but also because of its red color emitter, which is broad spectrum and enables this thing to get down to 2000 Kelvin. Now this does come at a cost. It's not as bright in the color modes as you might be anticipating. Now it has a double mount system on the front. You've got your Bowen mount for your existing soft boxes, things like that, as well as their new spotlight mount. And you've got the aperture mount on the outside here, which has a recognition system. Now the pins in the mount also feed power through to the motorized Fresnel, which is an optional extra. And there are also pins in the stirrup mount. This is to power and send commands through to the remote pan and tilt yoke which is also an optional extra. Now, the one big point of difference between this and other lights is not only does it have a fan cooling system, but it also has a liquid cooling system. So this liquid cooling system more efficiently removes the heat from the LEDs. So not only is this gonna give you longer life expectancy out of your LEDs, but you're gonna get an increased color accuracy over the lifetime of the LEDs. Now, this does come with a negative. So not only do you get the regular fan noise, but you also get another sound, which I think is a pump. Now, how loud is it? So this thing is realistically an M18 equivalent. I've heard M18s that are louder than this, and I've heard M18s that are quieter than this. So if you've got it within about five meters of a microphone, and that's quite a bit of distance, I would be definitely concerned. So I'm just putting that out there. I think it is a little bit loud, but hey, you're probably not gonna use it close to a microphone. Let's see how it performs with no modifier attached. All right, so as you would expect, it has a large even beam that could easily light up a large modifier. But just a note, from this section of the beam outwards, the light does have a slight green hue to a little bit more than a 1 8th correction gel. The results seem to be the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. However, the results are different with full saturated colors because when you're selecting individual colors, you don't have a broad spectrum. So it is very unlikely that you'll ever see any color fraying on the edge of the beam. Now the shadows at three meters are nice and sharp. And at a distance of 10 meters, they are absolutely razor sharp. Now let's see how it goes at a distance of five meters through a lace curtain. And I can't complain about that. The shadow qualities are nice and crisp. When using full saturated colors, the sharpness of the shadows can change depending on the color that you're dialing in. Now, if you're lighting a large area, this has a massive spread. Note here that not only is that spread horizontal, but it's also vertical. The palm tree is fully evenly illuminated. Now here I try to take advantage of the huge CCT range and get a mercury vapor look. And of course, you can also go full color. Now these barn doors do give you a lot of control. Now let's have a look at how the light performs with the supplied reflector, which is 35 degrees. 
Now all of the light is merged together so you don't get any noticeable color fraying. And the results are the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And they're also the same regardless of the color that you dial in. Now the shadow qualities at 3 meters are better than most faceted dish reflectors, but still not great. However, at a distance of 10 meters, I would say this is sharper than the shadows that you get off an M18 or an M40. Now let's have a look how it performs as sunlight through a window at a distance of about 5 meters. And I would say I'm quite impressed with the shadow qualities given that this is a 35 degree reflector. And just like with no modifier attached, the shadow qualities can vary depending on the full saturated colour that you dial in. Now if you're using this in a large area, it does give quite an even beam. And quite a bit of firepower if you're wanting to play with full colours. Now let's take a look at this combination with the barn doors attached. Now this is without the barn doors in play, and this is with the barn doors boxed up. Now it's not going to give you fantastic light cuts, but it could come in handy for reducing lens flare and some unwanted spill light. Now if you're curious as to how I'm powering this, it's running off an EcoFlow Delta Max. Okay, now let's have a look at the optional Fresnel, the F14. So that's a 14 inch Fresnel. All right, so this thing sells for about 2,400 US dollars and somewhere around the 4,000 Australian dollar price point. All right, so the first thing you're probably thinking is why is this thing so huge? Why didn't they just make a smaller version that can telescope out? Well, the reason for that is because this is motorized. All right, so you can operate it manually on the side here via this knob and it tells you on the side here what diameter beam you've got dialed in. Now it is a little bit slow to operate this way. Okay, so that's my, pretty much my only criticism of this. Now, if this is high up in the air and you want a flood spot, you can also operate it from the controller. You can also operate it off Citus Link, and my personal favorite, you can also operate it over DMX. So that's pretty cool. All right, now something I wanna show you that no one's really talking about is uh, something that I think is very clever with the design. It does have a problem at the moment, but they're gonna sort that out in the firmware. But here's the thing I really like. Let's say we're going to pack this up, all right? So I turn it off. And as it's powering down, you can hear the optics moving around inside. So what it's done is it's rebalanced itself. All right, so let's just make sure that this thing is completely unlocked and have a look at how well balanced this is. All right, so if you were packing this up, it's not going to sprain or break a wrist if you undo a locker. There's not going to be any sudden movements on you. Even if you decide to disconnect the light off the back, the, um, the optics are moved back to here. So it is fairly well balanced over the stand. And I think that's very clever, a very, very nice detail. But it does have one problem in the current firmware. All right, so let's say we're going to lunch. Okay, so we've turned this off. We've come back, we're powering everything back up. This was originally set to 50 degrees, All right? So let's turn it back on. And regardless of whether you're operating it manually, operating it over Citus Link or operating it over DMX, when you power it back up, it can't remember what its settings were when you powered it down. Now, further to that, if you're sending the correct DMX value through to it when you power up, it doesn't respond until it gets a fresh command. So if you've got multiple of these on set, what I'd suggest doing is sending a fresh command through to everything, maybe go to a previous save, or, and then go back to the current save that you're on, or sending out a momentary blackout command. But I told them about this fault, and they said, Andrew, we're already on top of it, it's gonna be in the next firmware. Now, something to note is it does come in this massive container, so that's something to consider if you don't have a lot of space. Now, it is sold with the eight leaf barn doors, they're fantastic, and another thing that is included in the kit is a set of what we call in Australia, skids. Okay, so these skids are to mount onto the bottom of the light. So the idea of this 
is you can store the light in your lighting truck with the Fresnel permanently attached. But here's a little catch with the skids. You cannot remove the light from the Fresnel when the skids are attached because they get in the way of the light being able to rotate and disconnect. Now these just simply screw in. You can do it by hand or with a screwdriver. Now it is dual optic and it has a 14 inch acrylic lens. So a lot of purists will say, no, I want a glass lens, but why did we have glass lenses in the first place? It was because the lights were hot. So we don't actually need a glass lens in the LED era. Now, just something to note, there is no spill light between the barn doors and the fixture, but as a negative to that, there is nowhere to use any wire scrims. Now it does have an IP65 rating, so you can use it outside in the rain, and the Fresnel weighs in at 16.9 kilograms. Now just to note, from this section outwards on the beam, there is some green color hue and a decrease in Kelvin. So right on the edge of the beam here, you've got a delta UV difference of plus 0.0031, which is somewhere between the equivalent of a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction gel, and a CCT drop of about 180 Kelvin. Now in flood, this has a 50 degree beam, and the drop off is typical of most Fresnels. The characteristics seem to be the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. Now one of the things I really hate with a lot of Fresnels is the barn doors aren't long enough to cut the entire beam. But these 12 leaf barn doors do a pretty good job. Now let's have a look at the light spotted up and I'm manually spotting it. And this is as fast as you can manually spot it. So it does take a little bit of time. Now, just to give you some idea of the brightness figures in flood at 5,600 Kelvin, this is giving about the same brightness as the 600D with the F10 Fresnel or about 84% the brightness of a 2.5K HMI Fresnel. Now let's see how it goes through a window at a distance of about five meters. And the shadows are typical of that from a 14 inch Fresnel. Now, if you're going to use this to light a large area and you're used to using HMI Fresnels, this has about 10 degrees less beam angle. But its 18 degree spot seems to be just as good. Now let's have a look with the Spotlight Max. First off, with the 50 degree lens attached. And I was really surprised by how even this beam is. There is a little bit of blue color fraying right on the edge of the beam, but as you can see here, I don't think it's going to be a problem. And the blade cuts are nice and sharp. However, the brightness levels are a little bit disappointing. Now it can do pretty sharp gobo projections, but there is a little bit of color fraying upon close inspection. Now I'm going to cover this projector mount in more detail in a later episode. Now, before we have a look at the 36 degree and 19 degree lens, I just want to point out that I've got some moisture in my lenses, and this results in condensation when the lenses heat up. Now, this condensation is after the light has been running for 20 minutes at 100% power. Now, some of my contacts have reached out to other users who have these lenses, and apparently they're not having this issue. So I might possibly just have some faulty stock. Okay, let's have a look at the 36 degree lens. And this gives a really even beam if you're after a spotlight effect. But there is a little bit of haloing around the edge of the beam, which is a result of that condensation. The results seem to be the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. Now the blade cuts are nice and sharp, but there is some concaving and you can definitely see the haloing coming into effect now. Now with gobo projections, I can't seem to get an even focus across the beam.
Now let's see how this combination performs with the 19 degree barrel. And again, it's got a beautiful even beam. Now I'm filming this after the light's been running for about 15 minutes. But as you can see, there is a fair amount of haloing as a result of that condensation in the lens. Once again, the brightness levels are a little bit underwhelming. If you were looking to use this as a high output option into a reflector system, you would actually get three times more light level if you used the Fresnel in spot. All right, so a lot of people keep asking me to do brightness comparisons in the episode. So here's the best brightness comparison I can do. We've got the CS15 here, and I'm gonna compare it to the Nanlux Evoque 900C because this is the next brightest light that I own that is full color gamut in a COB configuration. Now, I'm gonna do the comparison here with no modifier on the front because the brands have different beam angles on their modifiers, so they've got no matching modifiers. All right, so I've taken the results from this. They've been lifted from the review that I did, and I've also verified the results today because I was a bit surprised with the results. Okay, so here we go. At 3200 Kelvin, the CS15 is 32% brighter than the 900C. At 5600 Kelvin, the CS15 is 40% brighter than the 900C. In red, the 900C is 66% brighter than the CS15. Now, if you're wondering why there's a huge difference there, I'm putting it down to the fact that Aperture elected to go with a phosphor red. Now, a phosphor red has a way bigger spectrum and mixed in with the other emitters gives you a fantastic color score in your white light modes. But the trade-off is brightness. Now, with green, the 900C is 82% brighter than the CS15. And with primary blue, the CS15 is 26% brighter than the 900C. All right, so let's get into the DMX. So before we get into the actual testing, I'm just gonna do a bit of a talk about the DMX on this light. It does have all of the profiles that you would expect from a very top end light. Now, I just wanna talk about the smoothing options. So you've got three smoothing options. Option number one is no smoothing or smoothing off. Now, this is the best mode to have if you're gonna do an instant on off command or something like that but I definitely wouldn't leave it set up in this mode because if you do any fades, it shimmers really violently. Now it shimmers enough to give me a headache and I'm not photo epileptic, so I'd be really worried about it potentially setting somebody off on set if they're photo epileptic. Now the next mode is smoothing on and that is the best mode to use if you're doing transitions or fade to blacks, for example, or fades up that is ideal. And then it's got an extra smoothing mode. Now the extra smoothing mode really comes into its own if you're doing low end dimming. And I mean low end like maximum 1% brightness or 2% brightness, something really low like that. That uh, extra smoothing really does compensate for the lack of information that the light's getting over the DMX structure and also the lack of dimming parameters that you have, for example, this only dims in 0.1% increments. So if you are going from 1% down to 0% over five seconds, it would have 10 steps in there. This actually smooths out those steps very beautifully. The aperture is receiving its commands via CRMX. It is set to an 8-bit CCT HSI profile. Its dimmer is set to linear, and for the bulk of its testing, its smoothing will be turned on. To give you something to compare it to, I have a Sky Panel S60, which is also running off an 8-bit CCT HSI profile. Its dimmer is set to linear, and it is receiving its commands via CRMX. Now to get a brightness match, the Sky Panel is about one foot off the wall, and the aperture is about five foot away from the wall. Let's start off with instant on-off commands, and for this set, the aperture will have the smoothing turned off. And now we'll do that test again, but this time the aperture will have its smoothing turned on. Now let's do some half second cues. And now for some one second cues.
Now for some two and a half second cues. And now for some five second cues. And now for some CCT changeovers between 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin. And for this test, the smoothing is turned off. And now we'll do that test again, but this time the aperture will have its smoothing turned on. Now for some half second cues. Now for some one second cues. Now for some two and a half second cues. And now for some five second cues. Now for some changeovers between a CCT and a color hue, starting with instant changeovers. And for this test, the aperture has its smoothing turned off. Now the same test again, but this time the aperture has its smoothing turned on. Now for some half second cues. Now for some one second cues. Now for some two and a half second cues. And now for some five second cues.
All right, let's start going through all the data I've collected, starting off with the AC power draw. The maximum AC power draw recorded over several days of testing was 1,941 watt. At 3,200 Kelvin, I recorded 1,783 watt. And at 5,600 Kelvin, I recorded 1,794 watt. Now let's take a look at our dimming characteristics, starting off with 3,200 Kelvin first. And these readings were taken in the pulse width modulation dimming mode, which is the standard dimming mode. I've taken readings at 100%, 75%, 50%, 25%, 10%, 5%, 2.5%, 1%, and 0.1%. From 100% all the way down to 1%, the CCT is extremely accurate. As you dim the light, the color render scores do decrease, and the color hue, delta UV, or Y point between 100% and 2.5% is extremely consistent. Now let's take a look at 5,600 Kelvin. From 100% all the way down to 2.5%, the CCT is extremely consistent. As you dim the light, the color render scores do decrease, and from 100% brightness all the way down to 2.5% brightness, the delta UV, white point, or color hue is extremely consistent. Now let's take a look at our average CCT accuracy. And I've taken readings at every Kelvin from 2000 Kelvin up to 7000 Kelvin. Now I've broken this section up a little bit more than usual just to make sure that the averages are not misleading. Now let's look at our TM30RF color scores. The lowest score is a 91 and the highest score is a 96. Now as you can see across all of our common usage area, the light scores are consistent 96. Now let's take a look at our color hue or delta UV. Now this light tracks to the planking curve and at no point does it break away to track to the daylight curve, which is why I'm happy to give these averages. Now again, I've broken this up into more sections to make sure that the averages are not misleading. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of the Kelvins now, starting off with the lowest CCT that we can dial in. When I dialed in 2000 Kelvin, I got 2023. The TN30 color render results were 91% average color accuracy with 104% average color saturation. Now the CRI scores are not as impressive. 10 of them are under 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and the white point is the furthest it ever gets away from the planking curve, with a delta UV of minus 0.0017, which would make the light at this point magenta to about three quarters of a one eighth correction gel if you didn't dial any correction in. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3238 with an SSI score of 89. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy, with an average 102% color saturation. With the exception of R12, all of the CRI scores are plus 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0008, which would make the light at this point imperceivably magenta. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, it was only five Kelvin out with 4,395. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy, with an average 102% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and note the use of the green emitter plus the violet phosphor, giving us a very rich spectrum. And the white point came in with a perfect delta UV of zero. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,615, with an SSI score of 86. The TN30 color render results came in, with 96% average color accuracy and an average 102% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and note the use of the green emitter and the violet phosphor to give us a richer color spectrum. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0002. So if your camera's working to the planking curve, this is almost perfect. But if your camera's working to the daylight curve, then this light will be slightly magenta to somewhere around the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. Now I've taken some readings at 8,000 Kelvin, 8,500, 9,000 Kelvin, and 9,500 Kelvin for good measure. Now let's take a look at the highest Kelvin we can dial in. When I dialed in 10,000 Kelvin, I got 10,001. The TN30 color render results were 92% average color accuracy with an average 98% color saturation. But note the graphic here. This is where the graphics come in handy because the averages can be a bit misleading. With the CRI scores, R10 is only just below 90, but R12 is substantially below. This is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0007. 
Okay, let's have a look at how accurately this light can dial in its color vectors. But before we do, here's just a note if you're running it manually with the advanced HSI mode in the current firmware. The white point is slightly magenta. This will be corrected in a later firmware update. When I dialed in zero degrees or red, I got two degrees. When I dialed in 120 degrees or green, it was smack on 120. When I dialed in 240 degrees or blue, I got 241. When I dialed in 60 degrees or yellow, I got 59 degrees. But I would recommend dialing in 43 if you want a good yellow. When I dialed in 180 degrees or cyan, I got 188 degrees. And when I dialed in 300 degrees or magenta, I got 305 degrees. Okay, so just my closing thoughts. I think it's pretty clear that Aperture just decided with the ElectroStorm range, let's make the best possible lights we can. Let's make it our goal to make the absolute best lights that are available in the marketplace. And the result is incredible low end dimming. The build quality is sensational. This stuff is incredibly robust motorized accessories but here's the negative for me as a owner operator that works out of a van or maybe someone that works out of a small box truck this is way too big so all of that stuff is academic for us because we can't physically get this stuff onto the set so whilst aperture has gone after the big end here and clearly they've illustrated that they can take on top end manufacturers like ARI. I think they need to make a smaller version of this, maybe sacrifice some of those amazing features, maybe make us a Fresnel that telescopes in and out and has to be operated manually. And then you've got something that can take on Nanlux because if you forget about my size gaffers, you're gonna lose us to Nanlux, so that's my concern. Okay, thank you for watching Gaffer and Gear. Don't forget to click like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next episode.